Good morning. I think we're going to go ahead and begin our meeting. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if we could go ahead and begin by inviting our um, committee members to introduce themselves. If you would begin, uh, Janet, that would be great. I'm Janet Dory Smith, and I'm a member of the Early Learning Council. Julia Brim Edwards, I'm the OEIB board. Nicole Maher, OEIB board member and the chair of this committee. Samuel Henry, OEIB board and the uh, state school board. Um, can we have a moment to invite anyone who might be on the phone to introduce themselves? Nancy Golden, Chief Education Officer. Hi, Nancy. Hi. Do we have anyone else on the phone? Elizabeth Brand, Director of Research and Communication for CCWD. Um, I'm Charlie Hodson, Education Division Director, CCWD. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Um, there's either people who are trying to introduce themselves who we can't hear or people who maybe need to mute their phone. So either way. Um, and I, I think if we could quickly go ahead and introduce everyone else who's in the room just so we know who's joining us today. It's wonderful to see such a large gathering. If you could... Actually, Peter, if you'll start with Peter. Sure. I'm Peter Trampa, Director of Policy and Research, OEIB. Peter Gibson Kearns, Multnomah County Juvenile Court. Heather Quick, Dork Systems Inc. Cynthia Stottle, Southeast Works. Michelle Altman, Secretary of Brown's Office. David Moore, CCWD. Teresa Alonso Vion, State QP Administrator, CCWD. Dave Porter, Advocate for Dual Language Immersion and for High School Study Abroad Programs. Joyce Harris, Education Northwest Equity Program. Um, I'm going to interrupt you. No, I was just going to say I was in, on the advisory committee to the advisory subcommittee. Elise <laughs> 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 Huggins, Portland Youth sure Builders. Julie Kopeck, Portland Community College. Nikki Martin, Education Northwest. Uh, Dale Kim upon David Williams, Portland Public Schools. Okay. Well, thank you all for being here. At it's exciting to have people in the audience. <laughs> um, so I wanted to um, briefly give a welcome and just, again, say how much we appreciate um, having folks here and being part of this conversation. Uh, Seth is actually managing our public testimony portion, so if you have any desire to sign up and give public testimony, um, we invite you to do that with Seth, who is in the back of the room. Um, it is limited to uh, three minutes. Uh, so. Wanted to, to share that opportunity. Um, today we have a very focused agenda. Uh, we have really, um, this last year, been working to think about a strategy and how we might do a better job as OEIB to really address out of school youth um, and think of strategies to engage those youth better. Um, we have kind of three areas that we have initially looked at thinking about, which were really a strategy around GED, a strategy around alignment of other systems. And, uh, and of course, um, thinking about um, uh, retention and prevention of dropout. Uh, at this point, we have actually decided to really focus on the GED work because um, we, we recognize that there are such significant um, work taking place in youth, both the Youth Development Commission and the ODE around um, both prevention, um, system alignment, and then the focus on alternative um, schools uh, that we'd like to really think about how we can make a policy impact now around GED and then do a little bit more work and circle back to some of the other issues and Peter will kind of take us through that so I wanted to note that kind of shift in strategy um, because we have some opportunities to think about um, investments and bringing policies before the committee um, we wanted to sort of Strike while the iron is hot. Um, so those would be my welcoming remarks and kind of reorientation to our focus today and why it is so um, intentional around uh, GED and out of school youth. And um, with that, I'm actually going to invite uh, Peter to lead us through our second agenda item, which is really an, an update on the alignment activities among agencies who serve out of school youth. Thank you very much, uh, members of the subcommittee. Pleasure to be here, second meeting. Um, if you recall at the last meeting, we went through our agenda, but not didn't get to the last part of our agenda, which was the policy framework draft. 
that had originally been proposed before the committee or discussed at the committee. And as Nicole said, there were three elements in that draft. One was about the GDD, and we're going to spend a lot of time on that on agenda items four and five. But uh, for agenda item two and three, I want to give an update on where we are in the other two areas, because they will be back. I think we just need to do some more foundational work and discussion in order to bring them back in a more coherent fashion. So agenda item two is an update on alignment activities among the agencies who serve out-of-school youth. And one thing I want to start with is that we do have a partner uh, commission or council and uh, partner groups who are working, the Youth Development Council and the Youth Development Division, who have as their charge the, the uh, effective service for kids who are called <coughs> opportunity youth. Uh, opportunity youth are students who've dropped out at uh, high school age, or students who are older who are not uh, engaged in the educational system uh, and or are not um, employed. And the, the goal of the Youth Development Division, and Iris Bell is executive director of that, uh, among other things, is to categorize and uh, codify and understand what are all the different types of services who serve opportunity youth and how can they be aligned in ways that are more effective, uh, more uh, better way to spend the money, whatever. And so one of the first things I've done since the last meeting was I met with Iris uh, and a lot of her, her uh, staff to go over where they are in the process of that work of alignment and discovery. And what I was really pleased to find out uh, is that, first of all, Iris is going to present this herself at, the, at our next meeting she agreed to present, but that they have commissioned a report that analyzes the work of the ODE, um, the Community College Workforce Development, um, uh, Departments of Corrections, and other areas who serve opportunity youth to actually list the programs that are in place, how much is being spent, who's being served, and to the extent possible, what are the results. And the, the purpose of that document should be clear. It's a way to look at overlap. It's a way to look at return on investment, maybe in a very rough way, but, but in some way. And also to look for possible partnerships. And I was very, very encouraged by that uh, two hours that I spent with YDD staff. And quite confident that they have an equity lens in mind when they're looking at the work. They have a clear understanding of who the opportunity youth are in Oregon throughout our state and how, how they are distributed demographically. And I think that the work that they're going to do is, is going to be crucial. And I asked them, well, what, what is the place with the Equity and Partnerships Committee in terms of your work? And their response was they do want to present to us policy recommendations for our consideration and their support or uh, critical uh, analysis of because they, they're looking for partners who can really help analyze that. So the report is that that work is ongoing. Uh, my assessment is that it's gone much farther than I knew, and maybe much farther than other committee members knew, and that we're going to be able to hear a report, a pretty concrete report on that. Again, uh, the next meeting I would envision would be very focused on that topic. Uh, so that, that concludes my report uh, on that one or update, but I'll, I'll stop and just ask for questions. Peter, are we going to be, as we follow the money trail, are we going to trace uh, some of the funds that were previously allocated uh, for out-of-school view, I'll use that term, um, through uh, uh, what's left of the federal uh, funds there, the what used to be JJEC and, and, and JPAC kind of funds? The problem, Peter, with being around for a while is I also <laughs> remember things, including when I served on the Multnomah County Commission on Children and Families and also on the State Commission, and there were pots of money that the Fed set aside. I know that a lot of that money has gone away, um, but, but I think it might be helpful uh, if we're asking for some investment to uh, take a look at what has happened in terms of the decreased investment in, in that whole sector. I've added it to my list. So Thank, you. Thank you. Very much. Was it J Jack? Is that J Jack and J Pack. Okay. And if you ask me in the in the middle of the night what they stood for, I would be <laughs> pressed. But Iris knows. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
I do know, and, and I assume everybody's aware, but just so folks involved in this also understand, that with our new administration in Oregon, there's been a, 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 a look at how funding is distributed uh, in many areas, including serving opportunities you know, throughout the state. There were existing structures, and now there's some proposed new structures. Uh, and I assume funding streams like this from different sources are, are at issue and under discussion. So I'll just have to learn more about those, too. Okay. Thank you. Great. And as I mentioned in our introduction, the other area we're very interested in working on is really lifting up and expanding models that are serving um, young people well, and particularly serving youth who have been um, pushed out or of, of your typical high school. And um, the way we have described that is um, supporting positive and successful options for youth. But what we're really talking about is other options that young people succeed in um, when they have not succeeded in mainstream traditional schools. And we have agreed to sort of think about that option. And Peter's going to update us on where some of our partners are on that and the next best steps going forward. Will that include a lot of our community partners, like where you used to work in Naya and, and other communities? That's our hope is to okay. try to um, take advantage of some of the folks out there doing excellent work to mm -hmm. kind of advise us. Peter will share the details. Thank you very much. So this is something personally near and dear to my heart. Uh, alternative schools and envi other environments that, that students could be really successful in. And my recommendation is that we need to be in a fact-gathering mode, uh, but then we need to, again, take this on as a, a large agenda item, which is what what is the current landscape in terms of the different alternative type providers who are out there? What's the ongoing work with the Oregon Department of Education and others to um, rate their schools, describe those schools, consent, and, and what's going on at ODE, and then what type of policy recommendations could come from this group uh, in terms of the issues we discover. And, and I'll throw out one issue, just as a very simple one with alternative schools, having been somebody who's worked in alternative schools often, is they're usually not anything like a traditional school in the same area, and they're usually not like each other either. And so it makes the whole question of how you analyze them and support them much more complex than it is in other types of schools. The update uh, comes from the Oregon Department of Education and talking with Rob Saxton, the deputy superintendent. Uh, ODE is very, very interested in finding models where they can give support to schools that are struggling. And they already have a very effective method at elementary school where schools that are performing in the low percentage get identified, and they're identified so that support can be provided. So the ODE provides targeted coaches and best practices to these focus and priority schools. And honestly, most elementary schools, K-1-2, who are having problems maybe getting kids to reading, have a lot of the same types of issues and they can be treated, not identically, but there's a lot of similarities. There are a lot of systems that almost any elementary could put in place that would really help kids read better. What the ODD is now considering as they move forward is, well, does this approach in terms of support scale from up through the grades, from the elementary to the middle schools that might be struggling and to the high schools? And they're a long way from recommending anything in particular, but I do know that the discussion right now at ODE is, well, how do we do that same kind of system where we look at schools that are struggling and provide support? So at some point, ODE will be recommending to Dr. Golden, because she's asking to do it, ODE will be recommending some type of accountability framework that goes beyond what we have right now. And I think that recommendation will include something about alternative schools and um, charter schools. And that recommendation will go before the OEID. And obviously, all the members of this committee, or most of the members, are present for that. And it will be just a first recommendation. So there'll be a lot of probably intense interest from all kinds of different folks about that. And what, what uh, Rob Saxton said in terms of our committee that he's very, very interested in is, from all parties, is feedback to make those recommendations as good as possible so we provide the right kind of, of support for schools.
school. So how do we rank them? How do we support them? How do we coach them? Uh, in an environment where all the schools are very, very different. So the update from Rob was they haven't made any decisions at the ODE. They are looking at this question, uh, but they're a long way from having a, a specific response. Any specific response would be coming before this group in one form or another. And I think we're being asked, not today, but soon, to start to do some real thinking about what are our perspectives and from an equity point of view about alternatives and charters? Because uh, obviously if you look at alternative schools, their population often is very different than... And, and just to be clear about kind of the intent of this committee as it pertains to um, out-of-school youth and successful options, our desire was never to provide accountability or um, presume that those schools necessarily needed coaching. Many of those schools actually have much more successful track records than our public schools do with um, students of color and high-risk youth. And so our interest has always been um, when we look at uh, you know, a slightly higher than 60% overall statewide graduation rate and a, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50% graduation rate for um, many other populations, our interest has always been to recognize that many of those schools have much better outcomes and we need to provide more resources and support and invest in those that are working. I think in relation to what the Department of Ed is working on, I actually think we have a, a, an obligation and a concern to make sure that those schools are not receiving kind of an additional burden with, account, with accountability or um, you know, being asked to receive coaching or quote unquote support that may not match their actual need or desire or um, vision for themselves. And so I think we have an interest in that to ensure that um, no additional burdens fall on those schools or community organizations or charter schools. Um, and our longer term vision and hope is to expand uh, um, positive opportunities and, and models that work. I think what you're talking about will also, um, could be a strength in that it will maybe help us identify those, and some criteria for what we mean when we say, you know, truly works because, um, you know, not all alternative schools and programs are created equal and not all of them have the exceptional outcomes that I would assume that they do. I don't know if other committee members if you have thoughts on the chance Yeah, um, nothing out of this point. Okay. Well, I, I know that the state board has also had a big concern um, uh, all the way, obviously, across all of this, but in particular with um, the new growth model that we've adopted, um, taking a look at what that means in terms of uh, both alternative schools and, and charter schools, um, and uh, in particular those that uh, serve um, areas of the population that uh, have been underserved in other institutions. So it is a, a continuing and ongoing concern. That's great. And, and just to note, again, I, I kind of referenced this pivot before. Initially, we had thought we would have all three of these topics in one policy statement. And um, we're just noting and recognizing that we need to do a little bit more work on these first two. And we don't want that to delay us in bringing forward policy and investment opportunities. And the reason we're being sort of quick in our discussion and update is that we want to do a lot more work on these first two items and spend the bulk of our meeting today making a lot of progress on um, item number four and five. So with that said, I'll okay. invite you to, to lead us in item number four. So uh, there's two um, documents for item four and number five are related. And if you look at the title, they're almost exactly the same committee members. and. Sorry for that confusion, but they're, they're just so related. Item number four is a policy statement that would be uh, today vetted through the committee so that we can get it finalized and presented to the full OEIB board. And it's, as Nicole referenced, it's just around the GDP. And I want to credit the, the key contributors to this document and then take us through the document to just so we understand the components of it and see if there's areas where the committee really feels it needs to be changed. Um, and and I'll just, so first I'll recognize the contributions. The City Club of Portland 
did a magnificently well-written report on the GED in uh, Oregon. And I say magnificently well-written because not only did it describe changes in the GED, but it, it described how the GED is or is not useful for students, how it's not the same as a diploma, uh, but at the same time it can have a transformative and positive effect on students uh, and, uh, and the particular students who might qualify uh, for having some kind of transformative and positive effect are opportunity youth who right now are underrepresented in our colleges and universities. Also, the Secretary of State's office did an audit of uh, GDDs and a report, which also produced a series of recommendations. And so in the policy paper, we didn't try to reinvent the wheel. There's very little of this that did not come directly from testimony and discussion that appeared at this committee. And um, I just want to give credit where credit is due, because that's not necessarily work that our office has done. It's just something that we compiled. So if you take a look at the policy paper, there's an introduction, a really critical in this introduction, just so I think everybody is clear on this term, because it's being used at the federal level. Uh, opportunity youth and the definition of opportunity youth on page one, it lists there those three groups who are uh, considered opportunity youth. There's a vision statement here about, about what the, the plan is and the picture that we have. Um, and I'm not sure if it's good, if committee members would like me to pause with each section if you have thoughts, that would be a good thing. If there's anything in the, if there's anything in the introduction that <coughs> folks would like us to change or... Why don't we do this? Why don't we just give committee members like two minutes okay. and then ask each committee member to maybe um, provide any couple points of feedback they have that is not not to Okay, so that's great. That's great. So just the introduction. Oh, I'm giving them two minutes for the whole thing. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they read it with more hands. So well, we had, had a lot of meetings. Yeah. yeah. So I think that we need to maybe work on this to make it a standalone policy. I don't think a policy should be referencing other policies to deliver information. So the part where we're sort of like, see equity policy for our beliefs. Like I think we need our own beliefs and it's okay if we replicate them, but I think this needs to, to stand alone as a document. I think the other most important thing that we need to do, which is a little bit tricky, but in the state of Oregon, the GED is, all, is our alternative to a high school diploma, and we need to just um, recognize that that is what we're doing in the state. We don't recognize any other option, and so I think we need to remove any language that sounds disparaging or negative whatsoever to the GED. Um, even referencing in our vision statement the you know pre-brand an option that has declined in value over time, I think. Um, one of the biggest barriers that the GED has had is the um, sort of perceptions and um, negativity, largely 
you know, that folks in education have sort of given to the GED. Um, however people may feel, it is our um, it is our standard in the state. And unless we're taking on the work to have a different standard, we need to um, work on the standard that we have and making it successful. So I think any negative language um, needs to be removed. And I think um, really making it clear in our vision that, that you know, the GED has improved. It, ha it is a changed tool at this point. And um, it is part of our vision to reach 40, 40, 20. I and mean, we have included it as one of our outcomes as part of that policy. So um, I think we're saying that we're going to actually appropriately invest in it. Um, I think the other piece that I would say is, um, you know, really just trying to make sure that we're using as much strength-based language as possible. I really love the term opportunity use. Um, I think any you know reference of, of dropped out youth or um, incarcerated youth, I think that there's a, a different way to describe it and talk about it. Um, and then I think in the purpose and scope, uh, while I appreciate and completely in agree with the sentiment that it's not the intention of OEID to you know complicate or replicate um, anything, I don't really feel that that belongs in a policy statement. I don't think you know that's usually never anyone's intention. So I think we should really. Um, I mean, I think what we're really trying to do is provide high-level direction and alignment between efforts and produce the most high-quality outcomes. Um, so state that as a positive, really. Yeah, really stating it as a positive and a vision for the future, as opposed to, you know, apologizing for something we might unintentionally do. And then I think as far as the, um, uh, um, the, the sort of, Recommendations, I think you just need one sentence giving credit and then make the recommendations. Don't say like, here's the audit recommendations and here's the city club recommendations because going forward, um, we may have stolen the recommendations from other people and we will acknowledge them, but going forward, this is going to be the statewide OIB policy recommendation and um, breaking them up, I, I don't think is helpful. And then all this stuff around the data, I don't think we need any of that in there. It doesn't seem appropriate um, and we just need to build out our core beliefs and So, Dr. Henry? Well. Oh, and I wanted to say we've had a request that people speak up because the phone listeners are having a hard time hearing, and I will yell from this point forward. I have like a chipmunk voice, so I'll be louder. Yell out if you need me to speak louder. <laughs> <laughs> I want to underscore some of the comments of my colleague. I'm, I'm still up in the air about the about the data here, uh, about inclusion of the data here, not, not about the data here. Um, because I think it helps make a, a strong case. And so I think we need to, I, I understand her comments, but I think that for many people picking this up, they will not have read the um, City Club report. They will not have read other kinds of uh, uh, information that was referenced. And it becomes really helpful to, to figure some way in which that um, that is referenced because um, we need to consistently remind uh, folks that there's an evolution of, of these policies and, and that they're significant. Um, I want to do a little uh, walk out with um, on the first page in the introduction. Um, and, and maybe I've missed something, uh, but these categories of young high school dropouts and older high school dropouts, and um, I, I think we either need to acknowledge or maybe the issue's gone away. Um, when I first came to Multnomah County in 1992, we had a large issue of um, a population of students that completed middle school, and that was it. And um, I'm not sure where I suspected. Um, and again, it's not just Multnomah County. I've heard the same thing in Grant and Harney County. Um, and, uh, and we all are connected. Um, and, and so teasing it out, that I'm, I'm not sure what we do with, with that, Peter. And so I'm just tossing it back in your lap. Um, but I do think we need to confront that issue continually and see that represented in 
uh, the direction we're going. Now, clearly, when we were talking about the new GED, we were talking about ways to have some people who were previously in that group um, transition back into uh, into school and and and, and community colleges in, in a significant kind of a way. Um, but I'm, I'm still kind of worried about that. Um, it may even tap into our previous discussion with alternative, uh, particularly alternative high schools, um, and, and what happens with respect to that. The other thing I'd, I'd call out um, is actually a call out of, uh, I introduced myself, but didn't say that my full-time job, I'm a professor at Portland State, and that's the recommendation in terms of public universities. And I think we've got to be really, boy, my colleagues are going to hate me. Um, we have to be pretty insistent. I won't call it directive, but we need to be insistent that, that public universities, as as a whole and as institutions themselves, um, are really paying attention to two parts of this: to allow the admissions, um, as as was stated here, for the uh, revised GED, but to also not to track GED students as second class post-secondary attenders. And I'm not saying that I have witnessed this, but my suspicion from 38 years in higher ed is that that happens, and when that happens, it happens to the detriment of, of students who uh, want to make progress. Um, we have a large percentage in the, in the state of Oregon of students who go to, for example, the community colleges um, who end up taking remediation courses. Um, and in fact, we're, we're addressing that with some other, uh, other attempts, and I know that the um, Higher Education Coordinating Commission is, is uh, putting some focus there, but it seems to me that there needs to be a comprehensive and cohesive address in both the work that we're doing here and the, and the connection with um, the uh, HECC and the need to have public universities step up and play a part there. I've sort of talked around it, um, but and I'm not saying that we need to hit anybody in the head with a two by four, um, but there needs to be something in terms of uh, getting and focusing the attention of the university system uh, with respect to uh, the treatment of, of students who don't come in the in the what we think regular track of uh, middle school, high school, post secondary, um, and and who may uh, in fact be out for two or three years uh, in in that process, or um, not be able to get to post secondary education un, until they're in their mid twenties, um, and and. I think we need to stay uh, both appreciative of what that means and focused on how we can, as a system, support that. Thank you. Those are excellent recommendations. Really different than all my suggestions, which is great that we have such important different perspectives. Go ahead. Speaking of different perspectives. Great, um, Julia. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to be additive, um, I think, instead of different. Um, so just to, on, uh, to continue on the theme um, that both of you have raised, this is the phrasing about the new G GED and the opportunity to rethink, redesign, and rebrand. Um, I think there's a way without, um, to your point, Nicole, um, having anything negative about the current GED, but to acknowledge that the new GED needs a brand and a design. Yes. And so I would just rework the statement um, because I think um, uh, just there's two things I think with the new GED um, a value that comes out of it there's the intrinsic value um, to the person who um, secures it or earns it but there's also an extrinsic value which is um, the higher ed system and also um, to employers and I do think um, that there's value in having a sort of thorough um, and deep 
education campaign for these other audiences um, instead of us just sort of mandating or trying to tell higher ed like you need to respect the new GED or right. the GED but really um, work through what the differences yeah. are and the value and I think the same thing with should happen with employers um, because ultimately while there's intrinsic value also I think we all wanted to have extrinsic value um, so I would try and sort of bake that into um, our vision statement. Um, I love the shoreline approach concept. Um, I would sort of move that up because I think it's different than how we view many other points in the education system, uh, which is more of a, more of a pipeline. Uh, under the vision section, there's discussion about Oregon having access to a wealth of data about test preparation centers and student performance. Um, I guess I, I, I think this, that's going to be great and really be helpful to us in our work about re making recommendations, um, but just want to be crisper on so like, when are we going to get that and who's going to be doing the analysis and then how is it going to flow into um, our process. It just seems like it's a like great statement, but you know, right. two years from now or whenever it's available, who's doing it? So just being more crisp about that. Um, Let's see, purpose and scope, the second bullet there seems to be a word missing um, there. The, and then purpose and, under the purpose and scope, um, the fourth bullet, um, increase public awareness of the value of obtaining a GED credential. Again, um, while we could have a general community conversation, I also think focusing on higher ed and um, employers is really important because that's where the actual uh, uh, significant value can um, occur. Let's see. Um, this is an overall comment. I'm not quite sure how to bake it into this document, but um, I'm concerned if so I'm supportive of many of the City Club recommendations about allocating dedicated funding to subsidized testing, better test preparation. But what I don't want to do is have, well, we have a system over here. There's a lot of money um, happening that are being spent to, on all these activities. And then we're going to just add money on top of that um, versus, you know, what's, what programs based on this new wealth of data we're going to have are... Um, have the highest um, effic efficacy for mm -hmm. students um, and really sort of trying to get after spending our money well mm -hmm. um, first because versus just putting it on top of the current system. Uh, the other um, <coughs> issue, and again, this is sort of in the City Club recommendations, um, but I, I think this taking a fresh look at the alternatives to the GED, one thing I'd like to have coming back to the committee at some point in the future is um, these other alternatives that other states have, um, sort of what the basis, um, like who created them, are they public, were they created by, for example, the states, or are they um, other entities? I just, I'm um, hesitant about putting a whole bunch of new money into essentially what is a you know, for-profit test-taking company. Um, I don't know how any other way to yep. phrase yep. that, but it, um, you know, I just look at the sort of whole SAT and the, the industry that's been generated around trust prep or on that, and I don't think the state's dollars are most effectively utilized, perhaps, um, using that system. So I'd like some more analysis on what, what these other ones or how other states effectively utilize their, their dollars, um, you know, with the ultimate, what, what's best for students. And um, I don't disagree with the other comments that were made, so. Um. Great, very, very good, and good comments. 
Janet, you get to go last. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you did all the heavy things. <laughs> and I'm probably the least knowledgeable on this in the room because my work has been focused with the other end. So um, I looked at it as a draft. There were some <clears throat> grammar. I was an old grammar teacher. <laughs> Fifth grade. Mm -hmm. um, so there were some, I figured those edits would come out, but yeah. um, I saw it. And the one question, oh, the, another thing on that is I would, I would suggest wherever there are acronyms used that the first time it's used it is spelled out because I did figure out what CCWD meant, but it was probably a lot quicker for all of you. And um, that just helps because I, a lot of these are not immediately familiar to you. And I could throw out some early childhood phrases, maybe, that would mess with all of you. <laughs> I'm sure you could. Um, uh -huh. And then finally, I like the, um, where the opportunity youth is, are defined. I particularly like the ones who had the high school diploma or GED and are disconnected. I know some of those people. But I, when I read through it the rest of the way, it really talks about the GED. And so I... I, I know there's a tangible link there, but I couldn't see it in this thing, even though I'm, I really believe it belongs there. So that would help me. That's a great, that's a great suggestion. Great job, committee. You all came up with things that I completely did not think about, and I think it will really help us strengthen this document. Um, the other piece, Peter, that yeah. I'm noticing in all of our conversations, we have always discussed as a group the value of um, combining GED preparation with wraparound services mm -hmm. and support, and I think that there's maybe, um, it still feels missing, I mean, I, feel, I think we're missing like a whole belief section, or maybe it's the orientation that Dr. Henry talked about with where we, you know, um, some of the, the writing that um, City Club and the Audit Report did that, you know, really explained some of that. Mm -hmm. We didn't put that in here, and, you know, this can't be like a, 10 page policy statement. So I think we have to provide a little bit more narrative um, okay. so that kind of leads people along and um, that could be through a, a belief statement or what have you. But I know that the, you know, really being culturally responsive and having um, wraparound services that really embed GED programs where young people and adults can, you know, get support in other aspects of their life so that they can be successful with the GED is really critical, but that doesn't um, that flavor isn't coming out yet. So, so maybe, um, Peter, if you want to talk to us about like the next steps to make these improvements and timeline, and timeline because we really, I think this committee has a real sense of urgency, and we would love to have a policy statement that is strong enough to go out and vet with many partners across the state and get feedback from the people doing the work on the ground. And um, we... I will speak for us when I say we feel urgent about moving forward quickly. So tell us, tell us what you think our timeline and next steps are. Well, we can have an edited significant. Uh, thank you for all the comments. It's terrific <coughs> information. I'm glad we are recording this, right, Sam? We are. Okay. I think I got every note, but it would be critical to have all of that. There's no reason that this couldn't be back to you really quickly. I don't know if it's something we'd want to work on off, online between the meeting. It could be ready by the next meeting. It could be ready in a few days. Cause it all made sense to me what folks were suggesting. So, How do we feel if we work really fast in the next week to try to make as um, many of these improvements and additions as possible and then invited the rest of the committee to give feedback by email and then um, so that way we could actually take the next couple of weeks to actually get feedback from other folks? I wouldn't feel comfortable in the condition it is now right. getting feedback without kind of a lot of work, but if we could do that part quickly, begin to get feedback, and then have a goal of approving at the next meeting, is that possible? Yes. And then... I know my end it is, so. so... just in terms of timing, how does that coordinate with the OEIB's full work and then the investments committee? Well, I mean, are we se sequenced in a way that we can... So the, the policy proposal itself does not have to precede getting something to the outcomes of investments. So, in other words... So, m maybe technically not, but I think it will be stronger yeah. um, if there is a framework in which we're making a recommendation on. Mm -hmm. And we were not due to present anything to outcomes. We, we, we have as much time as we want, because we have a meeting with them later. Um, 
and I don't know the sequence. That's our next meeting time. Is actually the outcomes and investments in July. In July. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree with Julia. So I, I mean, part of the reason I'm sort of like, let's have our approval move forward so that we can. I mean, I think that would be great to be able to go to the full OEIB and say not only have we approved this as the equity committee, we've also done outreach and received feedback back from you know like with the equity policy, we actually got endorsements from close to 100 organizations um, to bring that forward and it'd be nice to have similar, a similar level of support and not be by ourselves bringing it forward to the OEA and you know, partners who felt excited about it with us. Um, so the, but our next OEA B full meeting is next week. next week and then there's not another one until... It's not in July, August we have the retreat. Um, which we're just currently discussing the agenda for that. But I, I think it, it goes without saying that that's a perfect and an obvious time that as a full board, folks are going to be looking at the outcomes, the investments that have been proposed over these months from other agencies. So if that's a target date, that, that seems to be the day that we would be talking about what are the different investments we've heard, how do we, how do we rate, yeah. how do we compare. I mean, we could actually, if we felt like we could get this to be good enough, we could bring a draft to the full OEIB, and I could give that as part of my equity update and invite people to give feedback, yeah. and then we could push for approval in August. I, 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 I like that. Um, I think giving them a draft uh, helps them both see where we're going mm -hmm. with this and also provides an opportunity for the rest of the OEIB to... to uh, Weigh in, um, and there may have been something that we have overlooked or, yeah. or should be underscored. Um, when we get to the full OEIB, we are more likely, for example, to have feedback from rural uh, 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 areas. Um, I, I don't know that there is a sure. piece there, but but I certainly would want to hear uh, yeah. from from my colleagues in Ontario and John Day about. Uh, about what they're reading when they read that. So, so Peter, I mean, admittedly, that will take a lot of work. And well, I will I, I'll commit to it. Okay. I, mean, I can focus all my time on it. My, my question is if you're proposing presenting it at the OEIB next week or... Oh, I think we would present a draft, draft. and I can do right. that in my equity subcommittee right. report. I will use all of my time on that. But you want the draft from me and then vetted through the group again, or? Yeah, I think we you? should make all these edits, vet it through this full group. I can do it by tomorrow. Um, and really, and then, you know, sort of present the, the, the best draft we can okay. possibly get to and recognize that, you know, it won't hurt our feelings. I mean, I'm sure people have great suggestions. This, I mean, today, um, all the suggestions from the committee have been wonderful, and many of them were things, you know, I hadn't thought of, so it's, I think we'll get that from our other OEIB board members. But I think they will need to see it one time before we then ask them to vote on it in August. And then having a policy passed, um, I think will strengthen our ability to actually get an investment. But I mean, I, I do think this this policy needs I mean, a lot of work. Yeah. Still. <laughs> so so um, I don't want to underestimate what well, we're asking you to no, do No, but luckily the feedback wasn't start over, it was very directed and very specific. Yeah. I added, just as I was hearing folks talk, a recommendation for, which had to do with that extrinsic benefit. And one of the areas had to do with higher ed, the other had to do with workforce. It just seemed like something that's not captured in any, it wouldn't fit in any of the other three recommendations. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, it doesn't honestly seem to me like anything that extreme in terms of work. It's, it's all, Focused and specific, so. Nicole, oh, sorry. Oh. I was just going to make a technical request. Is that when you recirculate it, can you do it in a track change version so that we can see where the ch it just makes it much more efficient of where the changes have been made? Sure. Um, and then the second thing, and maybe this is in the investments, this is really the work of the investments committee, or, or not, but the whole piece about what are we already, where's the money already going? Mm -hmm. Um, how much does our would our recommendation cost? And then doing sort of the deeper dive about not adding on it. So I don't know yeah. that, if that's our committee's work, but I. That's a good question. It's 
it's coming up actually today. Great. So okay, the money part. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Janet, in recommendation two, I understand the difference between an RFP and an RFQ, but is this saying so? Agencies, organizations send in their qualifications, and the decision is made based on their qualifications, and funding is awarded. It's still there's still a process of determining who would get funds. It's just they're not saying we propose to do this by X, Y, and Z. They're just saying we're qualified to do this. Does that make sense? Um, I understand the question. So there's lots of different ways um, you can mm -hmm. do an RFP or an RFQ. So right. I think I think we are just acknowledging um, that it will be important to have a list of qualified providers who meet a certain standard across the state. And then the they state. would be selected from that. Yeah. That's, that's just what, it's not that if you're qualified, you get it. Right. If you're right. qualified, mm -hmm. you are in the running. Yes, yes. Okay. yes. Okay. And then there's you know, a hundred different versions to I do know. each one. <laughs> yeah, so, um, anything you would add to that, Peter? No, okay. I do think it's going to be an interesting exploration into that model, mm -hmm. but it, it just has the potential to build stronger outcomes. I, I agree. I just okay. wanted to yeah. clarify that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. And, and part of our thinking is just the trying to figure out any ways that we could structure this to create a bigger, better system that's more aligned and more collaborative than the... Well, people are differently qualified, yes. and they could still... Yes. As one person recently told me, there are many ways to do things right. right. That's and great. <laughs> okay, Peter, will you um, take us to the next item, which is the GED Strategic Investment Recommendations for Outcomes and Investments. Right. So just in the interest of just complete transparency so folks understand why there's two documents that are connected, is where we sit in the calendar is that the, there's another subcommittee of the OEIB called the Outcomes and Investments, and they are already hearing from agencies and organizations, here's what you should be thinking of about funding. And those, what they're hearing is an example from the Oregon Department of Education is not something that has a policy paper attached to it. It's something where there's maybe broad agreement of that agency that it's important. So one thing that's very important at the Oregon Department of Ed is third grade reading. And therefore, uh, uh, Rob Saxton presented an idea for an investment to support third grade reading. So there are folks lining up to get in front of this outcome investment committee and at least get ideas in front of them. And the Outcome Investment Committee is not asking for final costs, final plans. They're asking for general ideas. But their intent is to be a critical listener and to push back on some of the ideas and give, give thumbs up, give, give feedback. And so since that work is ongoing, even though the policy paper obviously needs some work, and perhaps the recommendations are not totally fine with everyone, it seemed critical that we also look at formatting these recommendations, not just in a policy paper, but according to the format that the Outcomes and Investment Committee gave us, because we are we really need that document shored up as well. And if we don't get something before that group, even if it's in a draft form, even if it's just a, an idea, then I think we miss out as these ideas are being floated. And I'll just say, I support the Outcomes and Investments Committee as a staff member. And one thing I'm observing in that group is they ask questions just like, just like Julia was asking earlier. Well, what's being spent already? And can this, is this a, is this a cost neutral or is this a net cost? Um, who have you talked with? Who are your partners? They, they ask those questions and to some degree it's the responsibility of the staff to then, then provide that information. So with respect to the GED, I'll just throw out there that I've been in conversations already with community college <coughs> and workforce development. They are the agency in our state that provides GED services in 17, all 17 community colleges. And they have you know, all kinds of thinking and existing services and standards and programs of study that it's critical that we leverage and include in the discussion. If we and that's one thing, honestly, that was missing from the City Club report, is any rec you know, recognition that that activity goes on at CCWD. 
Well, there's also activity at the ODE around GED. So depending on where the student is in terms of age, they may call Community College of Workforce Development or they may call the Oregon Department of Ed. And that's another resource that probably should be discussed when we talk about these things. So I know it's it seems like we're, we've got a cart and a horse problem that our, our, our horse should be the policy paper and the cart is the recommendations. I think to some degree we're behooved to think of them in both formats and so that it's presented to you again in terms of a format that the Outcomes and Investments Committee is looking at, which is what are the recommended investments and what are our answers to these different questions. So my hope at this meeting was to address these recommendations. And um, I'd like to do the same thing which we just did a second ago, which was to go through the document and give us feedback. But I also provided for you, and you guys, you folks gave so much great feedback. Sometimes I'm not sure if I'll get a lot of great feedback, so we may not need the tool I brought. But I also brought a third tool which is straight from our equity lens. It's a graphic organizer, and it lists the questions that are on the equity lens, and then it lists for the different proposed strategic investments, well, what, what, there's some boxes there to get us thinking about, well, what are our answers to these? And Danny Ledesma, I, I over in the governor's office, actually was someone who helped me come up with this idea. It was a different set of questions at a different agency, but it's the same idea. It's a rubric, it's a, it's, a, it's a method to think through ideas, especially with an equity lens. So we'll go through the recommended spending, and if there's a lot of comments from the committee, that might be sufficient. But if we sort of get stuck, I'd like to go up to the computer and actually open up this document and start typing in notes around these equity lens questions, because they're really, they're really thoughtful. When you think about unintended consequences, I think that's a great discussion that really um, deconstructs and unpacks some of the ideas that we have. So with that, I'd like to start with the recommendations. And in about a minute, I'd like folks on the committee to read it and give feedback. However, before you start, I just want to frame that these two are meant to be complementary. And they are... Um, in at least one place, maybe unnecessarily provocative in their language. I'll just say that. Whoa. Um, I'm, just, I'm, I'm worried about some of the, how, it's, how it's languaged. Got some feedback on it, but it, it sits as it sits. So the first part is about defraying the cost of the GDP. And that would be end of preparation. And that deframement of cost would apply whether the student took that preparation and test at a community college or from another provider. And, and that's an important thing to think about is, would it be any other provider? Would it be an approved provider? And there's some really good questions around that issue. But strategy one is basically about defraying cost. Strategy number two is about providing more providers. So in strategy two, what we're saying is that there are existing community service, community-based organizations that do provide the wraparound services who are culturally responsive and already are successful with students. And through a process of qualifications and an award, we would add to those existing community organizations support to build their capacity to give GED prep as part of their wraparound service and help to, and uh, well that's what it is. So the, the two work together because as we incent more students to see the intrinsic and extrinsic value of the GED and they're like, well let's, let's get one, that sounds great. We have providers, a, a, a better shoreline of providers, a better profile of providers, a more diverse profile of providers, so that they can find satisfaction to their desire to get that um, service in, a, in a multiple ways. So the two really do work together. And so I'll stop talking now and let folks read through this, and then we'll go through that process that we did before, which I thought was really, really good. Does that work? Yeah. 
give people three minutes this time. Yeah, there's a lot here, a so. <laughs> and if you can pick out perfect provocative language, you get an extra bonus. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Okay, about 30 more seconds. questions before people give their feedback. So strategy one, is it the I think, I'm not trying to get the reward for finding the inflammatory language, but I think it's the voucher language. Um, Ding. Is the voucher language, is that about just paying for the cost of the test, or is that vouchering someone to go get the wraparound support and services as well, or just for the test? And, like the prep course. Like the prep course and the support and the services. So are we saying, payment for the test would follow the student wherever they go or the or support for all of it would go. Yeah, I think it's support for all of it would be our the OVIB's recommendation, staff recommendation, because just our experience in understanding the research is just paying for the cost of the test won't make a tremendous difference necessarily. Mm -hmm. And what will end up in a field will be paying for students but they won't pass and that will have all kinds of Okay. effects. There may be a student prepared to do it and he or she's ready and that's the one barrier. And in that case, maybe it would be appropriate. But the, the intent is broader than just the cost of the test. And then the second clarifying question is about um, strategy two, kind of the language underneath it. It's really clear to me what it's doing, but the, the one sentence that's underlined, I guess I'm, I totally get the creating the capacity for wraparound services with qualified providers, but it looks like you're also saying creating new testing centers, and I'm not, like, we need more testing centers, or, I could, like, I couldn't have, like, someone be like, I just want to create a testing center. 
Yeah. Can you direct me to where I'm there? It's strategy two, create right. community-based oh, training. Oh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah. It, the, even just the training word seems different in the testing center like that just sounds way different than the sentence underneath it. Yeah. So is that, should we just focus on the sentence underneath it? Yeah, no, thank you very much. You're right. It's, okay. it's not, the intent is not to create new testing centers. Gotcha. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so I'll just... Would, would, but I... Would the intent be to be able to uh, beef up, supplement existing testing centers so they could serve more and broader? Is that? So, uh, yeah, I, I'm ignorant right now, honestly, about the, the capacity, prevalence, access to the actual testing center. A lot of the focus has been on the idea of broadening the training so it's a and, and getting more kids to, to take it and engage back into mm -hmm. academics mm -hmm. so I have to research that yeah. it's possible that that's a huge barrier in a particular area of the state or one locale I, I don't know more, more than there's some GD prep and programs that are really amazing at getting kids so prepared and then they will go with the students to the, the, to the center and it works very well but we also, as we talked with folks, heard about folks who did a ton of work with students, got them ready, and then would hand them off to go to a, a large institution to do the, the test, and the student would just not feel comfortable, not feel safe, have a negative experience, and the student who was actually prepared to pass the test would then, at the very end, not succeed. And that is a common story heard across the state for a variety of different reasons. So what are we okay, what did you asking say did not for? Work? Once they would make it to the large testing center, even though they, they were passing all the GED prep tests and ready to go, once they would go to that last part, barriers do occur. And folks who are actually able to pass the test would then withdraw from the process because of a negative experience sometimes. Mm. So there are some barriers, but I don't know that, that the answer to that is not necessarily let's create a bunch of new testing centers. That would be a, a different, better handoff or a whole bunch So of what's our intent here? Well, so there's, I think there's two strategies here. I'm in for the second part. Right? I think it is to provide more resources and support for organizations who have um, <coughs> demonstrated success at doing quality GED preparation alongside wraparound services. So to expand the portfolio of those providers. Right now you have, you know, philanthropy is giving lots of small grants to organizations across the state to do that. Um, districts are contracting with nonprofits to do that. Um, some, you know, you have um, programs that are just doing it as part of their caseload work, and there's no real system or coordinated effort. You have some community colleges who have very robust programs. You have some community colleges who just offer the test. Um, and then you have, you know, ten nonprofits in that community doing a variety of things to then send that person to the community college. There's wonderful examples. So really, what would this pay for? Um, this would be resources to go to nonprofits to do GD preparation and wraparound services. Whether that's already on a, say, a community college it could campus be a, or It could be not. a partnership. It could be... Okay, okay. I'm just trying to... It could be... A, I mean, clarify what... I'll follow. This is my follow-up question just before I forget is... It sounds like there may there could conceivably be a case where a testing center might make all the difference in the world in one particular place. So I guess my question is should we not take it out that is possible? I think that's a great I mean it just the way it's framed here, it's that sounds like what we're doing and I think it's not what we're the main focus is, but I don't know that we're saying we would never consider that. If that's you know, if there's some whole section of Oregon that doesn't have a testing center or you know, or um, there's a need to enhance or build a partnership around a testing center in a community. I don't know that we would want to say we would never consider it. It's just not our main focus to do testing centers. Is that a fair? Yeah, and sort of ideally if we do our work right as a state, um, there'll be fewer, there'll be less need for that in the yeah. future. Yeah, exactly. So that's instead of building up a huge yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. You know, that's about five or eight years in the in the prayable. <laughs> we gotta get exactly. we hope that would. But we don't want to create yeah. a system that sure. just continues to be a pull market for mm -hmm. something yeah. that we're trying to systemically yeah. approach in a different Agreed. way. Yeah. So the only the, the thought I, I as I read these, the thought that I had was that the outcome is 
getting folks ready in, ready to enter the world of work. And so for deferring the costs for, for post-secondary, post 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 exactly, mm -hmm. but uh, ideally towards career, right? Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder if there's, I, w I just wonder if there's a better way to incentivize services that are more closely connected to post-secondary and work connect and employment connections um, to make that more explicit in this, if we're, at, if we're, we're, if we're trying to incentivize it. Because I think that that's, the goal there, because I, I, I think, like Julia says, if we do things right, you know, we're actually getting high school graduates. You know, a GED is, is fine, but you know, the goal is that we want Oregonians who are better prepared to enter higher ed so that they can work the workplace. That's I think that's our absolute intent, and we just need to say it much more clearly. Um, I mean, the whole strategy number two is really this idea that just getting someone to pass a GED test is not enough. You want, you know the service that says, and then when you pass that test, you're, here's your application to right. community yeah. college or higher ed or training program X, Y, or Z. So I just think we need to say that better. Um, I'll just give my kind of overall comments for this. Um, so I'm not as big of a fan of the, the voucher effort. I don't, I'm much more interested in strategy number two. I think strategy number one, um, it makes me nervous that we could be, um, you know, really taking vulnerable populations and then creating kind of a complicated voucher system. And in my experience, um, those systems, uh, when it pertains to nonprofits and community colleges trying to forecast their business, their staffing, their ability to provide high quality um, services, it it's actually ends up being a real barrier to creating quality programming. And, um, I think our, our money, resources, time, and energy could be much better used um, really bolstering strategy number two um, with, uh, you know, really incentivizing partnership, alignment, collaboration, and quality outcomes, and really um, getting resources to help students not just continue the GED, but also make it to the, to, you know, the, the next step in their career. Um, the other thing that I think this is really missing is really um, much stronger language as it pertains to our equity lens and the, um, I think we need to be very straightforward and talk about how um, people of color are entirely overrepresented in our populations of students who have not completed high school and are entirely underrepresented in the population of students who are currently and today successfully completing GEDs and of the students um, that are successfully completing GED, students of color are the least likely the ones to go on to the second step. And part of the reason we're doing this and part of the reason this is in the equity committee is to remedy that um, major issue and to provide a, a different, better system that meets the needs of those students specifically. So um, I think building that in as, um, there's actually some questions that really ask us to talk about that, so I think we should. Go Can I ask a follow up to that? We did not resolve in the policy paper the question of including or not including the data. That Some of that answers your question. Obviously, it needs to also have the issue about the GED completers going to the next step. Uh -huh. But I just want to resolve on the policy document that we have a vote on including yeah. or not. I'll, I'll well, certainly so I it. think actually some of the data that is included is wrong, first of all. And second of all, I think a lot, like if it's a standing policy, like the data's going to change. So it just seems mm -hmm. weird that you would have like a. So you may be able to just address that since you want to have a, a policy that um, sort of is somewhat timeless, or at least yeah. timeless for a year, um, <laughs> that you can um, summarize that the data, just like you did, um, yeah. just did, that um, the disproportionality of um, yeah. who's um, represented in the different groups without actually laying out yeah. the specific numbers. I think that'd be, I would agree with that. That is, the, the purpose of this is to address the disproportionality. Yeah. And separate data can support that, but but the core of what this is about. Yeah. It, and maybe the way in in the policy is to talk about um, I think the t two goals: one to increase the overall um, number of um, individuals successfully completing their GED, but then the second within the sort of the the, the disproportionality. Yeah. Or to have those completing the GED reflect the population who are out of school. Yeah. Which would then speak to developing strategies that meet their needs. Is that? Mm -hmm. 
Is it my turn for comment? Or yes. Or actually, did you are you, are you finished? Good. Good. She's on. So, um, just based on the conversation um, and the observations that you've had, I think that there may be sort of a, um, a way to bifurcate the work. And um, so I look at sort of those two sort of general recommendations that cost money here. One would be um, covering the cost um, for students um, to take the test. So that's pretty straightforward. And then the second piece is more this um, sort of test prep and the wraparound services, and um, it requires more than just the student. Um, it's, I think it's much more complex. Um, the state recently announced they're covering the AP and I, IB tests for students in need, which I think is sort of a similar alignment of this is a very specific barrier. Um, there's a very targeted, I think pretty efficient way to approach that. Mm -hmm. um, so I perhaps separate that because I think the second issue is more complex and I would hesitate for us to, um, I'd be concerned about us making sort of a statewide recommendation of like here's how to do it. And one thing that we may want to look at is, you know, would we recommend some sort of pilot um, so we can get more data um, sort of flesh out more um, some of the issues and questions or answers to the questions that have been raised. Um, but I think it, it's going to be a significant amount of, it's just less mm -hmm. focused and targeted of how, what the remedy is mm -hmm. and how you build it. Um, so, and probably significantly more resources. Um, so I think that might be something the committee could look at is, do we recommend um, a pilot to, to be built on, um, which I think is what's ha what they're doing with AP and I IB, so very targeted approach to that specific barrier, and then how do we build sort of them the kids to be successful as they take AP and IB. Um, some other comments I had. Um, And just to back up, just make sure, are those with what is what you just said really more geared towards strategy one of like let's try it out and pilot it in a, or is that geared toward the whole? Like, um, so strategy one has both the training and testing put together. So I'm suggesting looking at it as sort of a two part gotcha. um, versus strategy one or two. Gotcha. Um, so maybe even taking the, te the testing part and modeling it more like the AP, IB strategy? Actually. Well, just, just the, the, the actual paying for the test. To me, mm -hmm. that seems like something you could switch on or off in a really, like, could we do that in the next month? Like, yeah. make a recommendation that would had sort of a solid basis. Um, I think the other piece about um, providing resources and building an infrastructure uh, to assist students is um, more complex and that instead of trying something out statewide which may be expensive um, and then hard to um, manage or adjust the mm -hmm. picking like a couple demonstration sites of like who's doing it well right now what, what are the best practices from that and then making a more extensive um, investment recommendation mm -hmm. based on that. Um, because so, and then my other just general comment, and this it's more of an observation, and I don't know the answer because um, I think it's more complicated than just saying, um, making a statement about it or directly connecting the data and then making an investment against it. But it's related to um, the test prep and um, sort of having seen sort of um, the test prep. That is offered to students for um, primarily SAT, but also ACT. That you know, widely varying um, levels of effectiveness for students, and um, so providing some sort of barometer or um, way for students or policymakers to help um, be, be make investments in the programs that are most effective mm -hmm. and be 
linking dollars to effectiveness. And my, my cautionary um, thought about that is, so if you said, you know, if you have a choice between two different test prep providers for the GED and like this, this one, you know, they get 80% of their students um, taking, you know, passing the test versus this, which is 20%, the easy analysis would be like, I'll go for this one because that's got the most effective and that would be the best use of the, ta the taxpayer's dollars and our investment to put it in the most effective program. Um, but I know that's an oversimplification because the um, test prep center, it may not be that they're ineffective, it may be that students had a lot more growth than they needed, just <coughs> the population or where students started in order to take it. Um, but I think to, um, to ignore um, or not to take into account effectiveness, I think we should, we should be providing some guidance to students, um, their families, um, and also as just stewards of the taxpayer dollars of like how do we get kids in the most effective program, acknowledging that effectiveness, the measurement of effectiveness may not just be that simple. Passes. Sorry, that was a That's great. No, I think, I think we've been concentrating to figure out how to work in quality and, you know, this. Yeah, and, and that's why I just think this piece about the test prep is a little, is, I want to make sure we do, we do it right before yeah. we make the recommendation. Um, I was just going to mention that that idea of quality has come up when we talk with partners, and there's no licensing. Just to, it's just information. I'm not suggesting there should be, but there's no licensing. There's no certification. Anybody can offer the GED prep, um, and there isn't something like you know early learning starting to work on rating systems, and that allows for some. You know, and maybe that could come from all this. We'd have to. It's complex how you rate, but. Just in terms of providing information, folks don't know what is effective or not. So it's, it's tough well, to there's know. such a right now people are just trying to find prep services anywhere because there's such a lack of a lot of people will give you the test and charge you for the test, not where many people that actually have the time and capacity to build that program. So. And it's the definition of success had to do with these longer term outcomes that you folks have referred to in terms of post secondary and career. That would provide a whole new way to measure these as opposed to just test passing, just to throw that out. Well, I have no doubt that if there's money available, test prep services will be created. <laughs> you know, I mean, beyond what is already in place. And so that's why I think providing guidance, at, you know, I just think of the whole issue nationally around sort of for profit higher education and, you know, what's the best use of both taxpayers' dollars and also the, the money that uh, individual students are putting, going to be putting into that, and that we should have a point of view on... Yeah. Um, Absolutely. And there are some excellent prep services that exist today, you know, but there's many gaps as well. Yeah, and what are, what are the qualities of those, and how would we help um, both make individual students, um, but also the state, an informed consumer, in effect? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Janet, I want to make sure we're not missing any comments you might have. Well, I'm, you know, at the fundamental level here, but um, I, on the second page, um, the Census Bureau, Oregonians, 11% black, a high school diploma, and I'm not an Oregonian by birth, but I've lived here a while, and I can see some people saying, well, that's not so bad. I mean, 11%. It could be worse. And I don't know how that, um, then the GED score and the GED score with honors, um, I, I, I like the sound of that and I'm just not quite sure what the difference would be. Would that be where the youth who had GEDs or high school diplomas, would we encourage them to do the GED with honors or Sure. Then we have a two classes of GEDs here, so then does one become less? Yeah. Sure, I can answer your okay. that real quickly. So uh, the GED score, essentially that means if you pass that test, you are normed to have the same skills as other mm -hmm. um, American students who right. graduated high school. If you score high enough and are normed as the um, GED score with honors, you are normed with other people who mm. are prepared for college. So okay. it's normed with... But are we saying, are they equally attractive to us, or do we want more people to go 
to achieve the honors, and then would those be the kids that are disenfranchised? They have their diploma, but do you know? I'm a, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think right now, I mean, I think there's a couple of yet. things. Um, well, I think a couple of things. One, Oregon only has 11% of people who have not completed a high school diploma, and that's frankly as low as it is because we have so many people who move here who have obtained high school diplomas okay. and degrees from elsewhere. Okay. Our actual graduation rate of Oregonians and Oregon is born is much, much lower. So I think that's so a that See, I think that would be confusing because people would be like, okay, how come I see in the paper that we have this low yeah. graduation rate and they're saying it's 11%? I, just yeah. think, so it, I think we need to we make need to that clear that of issue. kids graduating from Oregon. The second lowest graduation rate in the country. But see, that's what I thought. So when I'm looking at these things <laughs> and it's saying, I'm thinking, well, what? So I think that piece is important. And then I think to your second question, of course we would want more students to graduate with honors mm -hmm. because that would mean our Oregon students are doing better. Um, but I don't think we're at that place to okay. sort of, I mean, right now we just want people to be graduating okay, high I just school. Wanted and, to see, I get yeah. this. Yeah. So then on page three, when you're talking about language, the sentence that describes um, the second sentence in the phrase troubled families, um, I know what that means to me, but it, as I've been learning and trying to learn, some things like that describe people in a way that triggers reactions. And I have had children early in life. I mean, I, I think those are all true, and there might be a better way. To yeah, I, we don't want to sound like that. we're blaming families mm -hmm. or people. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we're trying to do is remedy our system of how we offer and support families and improve ourselves and our systems and our organizations, right. not say you're hard to serve because you're a troubled yeah. family or whatever. Gotcha. We can totally make those changes. And then, where again, the passage rate ranked Oregon 11th among states, 74% tested. And again, I somehow that doesn't sound as bad to me as I believe it is. Well, or if it's, I mean, you know, because I, I do think we tend to think, well, okay, that's eighty that's 89%. That's a great point as well. And I mean, the reason we're 11th is because so few people take right. it. But we should just, <laughs> well, I think that, you know, there's some other statistics and it would be mm -hmm. helpful when I'm thinking of my tax bills. Mm -hmm. And then the cost to the individual test taker is um, $155. And it said it's a significant increase over the previous cost. Then there's an asterisk, but I could never find where that asterisk at, Thank you. I that thing that went. Too. That, that text yeah. Yeah. To. I can't yeah. even say it, but you can see it here. It's just the previous cost. So, so, so I'll fix that. that would be helpful. And, and Tina, I'll give you some more feedback around some of this data offline. I don't think we're going to spend time doing it now, but I think. I think those are all really excellent points about just really telling a consistent message and story that's not going to confuse people. And then my last thing, and I, I like the whole thought about making these classes may, measure some of the soft traits of socialization and the effort to get through four <laughs> years of school. But then the other side of me from selling this to other Oregonians is we have this four-year high school thing that we've set up that they could get all of these opportunities. And so why, I, I like, I think it's a good idea, but why, my negative side would say, why are we going to make another thing when we've already got a system they could? I don't think that the writing clearly says why that's important. I know it's important, but I, I don't know. Okay. Maybe it's just a little tweak. Okay, those are great pieces of feedback. Can I ask a follow-up on that one? Would it be appropriate, akin to what we talked about earlier, about how long it's going to get to, it's going to take a while to get to 100% graduation, mm -hmm. that this is a, a transitional, hopefully a transitional investment, something right. along those lines that we are getting, our intent is to serve these students by 12th grade. Mm -hmm. but. The facts on the ground right now is that that's not. And the 40, 40, 20. Right. We so should put by this out of business. So we need something in there about, well, why are we doing this? Then the one, my last, on number five, on page five, the about who, how do we know this will result in improvement? And that 
representatives of the Portland Hispanic Metropolitan Chamber testified that in the Latino community, education tends to be a family effort. But it's bigger. That's one example, or maybe it should just say one example, because that doesn't speak for all groups. I don't think would mean that to say. Okay. So either do more or just say one example is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can I ask a follow up to the committee? What I heard, I oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. no that's okay. Um, I want to support uh, what my my colleagues have said. I also because I think that the uh, deferring the cost needs to be um, focused in, in uh, and um, the, there there are two parts that are sort of at least in my head, warring, uh, competing is better than war. Um, competing with this. Uh, one part is the uh, way that GED has been used and, and therefore the higher representation of GED um, amongst people who don't necessarily need the, need the money to take a GED uh, uh, test. So I, I, again, have, have some questions about that. Um, I think both of them would actually be good pilots. Um, the information I have back, and, and my community college colleagues, please forgive me, I, I was paying attention, but the last time we did a budget cycle for community colleges, I heard two or three different presidents say they were losing money um, by giving the GED on campus. They felt they needed to do it, but they, um, it, it, was a, it was a pull on, on the uh, campus, uh, the community college budget. Um, I think there's some room there for some more information. I'm not trying to ascertain the veracity of that, but I think there's a pull on on community colleges to to um, continue to support the GED, whether it's the old GED or the new GED, um, that that financially needs some addressing. And I think that paying for uh, a voucher system only addresses a, a little piece of that. I suspect that it's particularly at those community colleges that have a whole set of wraparound services. Um, for for students and back to um, my colleague Nicole's uh, point there, a real question has been how does this address particular communities of color and um, and families in, in poverty that um, is 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 this likely to be successful in terms of addressing that? So I, I think that's a, a a huge question and I think at the next level, our colleagues, and certainly I would think the, um, the budgetary, uh, both in the governor's office and the legislature, would, would have some real interest in us having the kind of numbers that supports um, the ask there. The second strategy, um, I would agree again, uh, could, could do with uh, uh, in some focus uh, in terms of um, having a couple of pilot uh, uh, centers where we take a look at in some different configurations, perhaps one that's already on a community college, one that may be uh, an independent place and wrap around, and and really take a look at that. Um, and we really need to look over a, a little while to see what's what's going on with respect to that. I know we like quick turnarounds, um, but that's kind of situation that I don't think you're going to get the kind of data you need for two years um, in terms of uh, having, having the money go out, having it implemented, and then being able to track the kinds of numbers. And I also see a difficulty with that because in the meantime, we're going to go from the old GED to the new GED, uh, just among some of the others. So I think we need to be real upfront about what we're asking. We need to say that this is going to take a while. We need to say uh, who this is focused on and, and, and um, what exactly it, it will address in some very, very clear uh, terms. Okay. Peter, if you have any last questions or comments, we have actually a few people signed up for public testimony, so I need to make sure we have good time to listen. Okay. So. Well, I, um, I'll just say I, I took down all the notes. Great. Again, thank you so much for the feedback. We didn't even need the tool. 
uh, take a look at that graphic organizer at some point because it might be a way to stimulate more thinking. I don't feel consensus from the group on what to do with the investments, although I feel like Pilot certainly came out with two of the three. Um, Julia's comments about strategy one, just pulling out the testing fee akin to APIB resonated with me because it's another, I can see it being in a category of things that we're already funding more straightforward. Uh, but I, I don't know if there's consensus about this idea of pilots. Well, I think, I mean, I guess I was looking at this whole thing as a pilot anyways, mm -hmm. just because when you think about what we're going to probably be able to obtain financially, it's probably only going to be able to afford funding some select promising things around the state anyway, so that may have just been an assumption I was bringing in. We're not going to fund the whole comprehensive statewide system the first year out. That just does not seem reasonable, so I think um, we need to think about scale and, and so forth. I, I guess I would say maybe, maybe I was hearing more consensus in my mind than is really real, but um, I actually think Julie's suggestion of kind of pulling out the, the pain for the testing fee and then really focusing it on either low-income folks or some priority um, strategies. And then I think what I also heard Julia saying was really um, taking the second part out of GD prep and really making it a little bit more specific and clear, as um, Dr. Henry said, um, might be the, the way to go. Is that? I think that's consensus yeah. here. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And I guess... Um, and then do all the improvements that Janet suggested yeah. also. That's yes. consensus also. <laughs> so I think, um, Nicole, we should just be more explicit in it. Because I think if your assumption was it was a model and pilot, it doesn't actually uh, say we should that. Yeah. state that. Because in some ways, it looks much bigger than I think... Yeah. yeah. But I will say maybe like there might be a different way to describe it. I think communities are feeling exhausted and piloted to death. Like pilot is almost like a swear word in the nonprofit community anymore. So I don't know if we could say the money goes away. Yeah, and it's like you never actually fix anything or do anything. You just do a pilot. Or so um, maybe it's like a phase. 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 Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think there's maybe you know expansion of promising practice and phasing of because I do think we do want to ultimately get to a place where we have a, a better statewide system of alignment and collaboration and coordination. But. And I, I mean, another question I would have to think about is I almost feel like there's this third piece about better alignment and yep. collaboration and coordination and I, that may be a cost neutral strategy but I do think that we None of these things are going to work unless we have much stronger, clearer, inclusive leadership. And it can't be, you know, this group does GD stuff this way, and CCWD does it this way, and they never talk to each other. Like, someone's going to have to actually invest time and capacity in making that different in some way. And I can only speak for what I heard from the community colleges, but they completely agree. Yeah. What I heard is that needs to have, and yeah. they have standards that they're, I think, very aligned to Common Core and all that. So, Great. okay, thank you very much. Great. So, all right, I'm so, going to go ahead. It's just another, um, and this may not be consensus, but um, the issue of the word, at some point there's new funding, and I guess I, um, I don't want to assume that all the money that's currently being spent is how we'd want to have it spent, so I want to have the flexibility that, um, <coughs> Especially when we're making, because I think there'll be inevitably trade-offs um, mm -hmm. that the larger OEIB is going to make, and that yeah. um, be we'll be better positioned if we um, don't make that assumption that it's mm -hmm. for sure, sure, for sure. Now. And Peter, we will you kind of shared that we will get the full presentation on where all the money being spent on GED is being spent now, and it's like that's that sort of coming in the works. Yeah, and it was actually all services to opportunity use is what I was, then, and I glanced at this report. I'm assuming that GED is a line item, but okay. I don't want to promise we don't that, know. Okay. that's okay. my assumption. Gotcha. Okay. It may be scattered several places. Right. It might be called it different stuff. And well, and I will tell you, I mean, when we do economic opportunity grants, <laughs> the number one request we get is for GED support from nonprofits across the state. So okay. people are looking for money. I mean, and if you talk to other foundation leaders, we're all funding a bunch of that work in a bunch of different ways because it's a, a, a significant need from people's perspective. 
Um, okay, so um, our first person who signed up for public testimony, I do not see, but I will call her name, uh, Joyce Harris. Joyce had to go, so. So, um, but our next person is actually Carla Gray from Trenton Public Schools, and just to, I, and just to share, we have three minutes, and we have to be strict. So it's. Um, Hi, I'm Carla Gann with Portland Public Schools. I'm the program director for our contracted private alternative schools, of which Portland Community College and Portland Youth Builders, Southeast Works, and others are all GED providers, preparation programs. And I first want to commend the committee on um, addressing this issue directly. Um, I'm very excited to be having a public conversation about our old and far, our opportunity youth, our overage, under credit, however you want to characterize the population that is significantly off track from a four-year diploma um, and or is out of school. <clears throat> With regard to items two and three on the agenda, I know we're not directly as, um, talking about those, but I'm excited to hear that there is a for further discussion about how we expand our definition of accountability. Um, together with a group of leaders and some folks from Education Northwest, we are piloting an alternative accountability framework in Portland Public Schools. We just finished our first year of that pilot, um, pilot, uh, and headed into our second, and it's inclusive of <laughs> diploma. Yeah, I know it's a pilot. We'll see how far it goes. Um, and, and it's inclusive of diploma and a GED. It acknowledges skill growth for students who are disconnected and off track. And it acknowledges a 170, which is the honors GED um, rate, as well as high school diploma for students who completed outside of the four-year cohort. It is not officially acknowledged at the state level, or really, it's really a pilot in district right now. And, and therefore, I'm just excited to share that learning. We are part of a national conversation with other folks around the country who are also trying to figure out how we measure accountability for our, the, that population. Um, on to the GED, um, I love the Shoreline concept and I just had a couple of comments. So first of all, um, we did a segmentation analysis in our district to look at our entire student population, both those students who graduate or are on track for graduation and those who are either slightly off track or significantly off track. I'd recommend in looking at what the demand is for this sort of service around the state when we talk about finances to do some sort of a look at who our population is in the state and really have a deeper understanding of that. Um, <clears throat> I also think that as we move forward, as you move forward, that, that acknowledging the GED as a completion within um, ODE language and statute is really critical. Right now it's counted in the five-year cohort graduation rate, but there's very little attention provided to that. And in fact, the state statute discounts GED as to, in terms of contracted private alternative schools. So while we have the capacity to contract with private alternative schools who are GED options programs, the, the outcomes are still fully aligned with a high school diploma. So the, the, the conflict that we run into is that um, we have standards and expectations that are towards a high school diploma and GED is the credential. I would encourage to look at state language that um, streamlines, and this is number two and three on your recommendations, that the standards and expectations for qualified providers need to be aligned with state language regarding private alternative schools and what districts must require in contract with these schools and that it's all aligned really to college and career ready with the GED or high school diploma being the credential along the way. So that's where you get a GED plus model and that they're both aligned in terms of the expectations. Great. Thank Perfect. you very much. Great. Could you um, send your comments in writing to both Peter and Seth? <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> um, yeah. Is it Pam Blumenthal? Yep. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. From thank you. Carla covered some of the things I was going to say. We didn't talk ahead of time, but um, <laughs> thank you for giving me a moment. So I'm from Portland Community College. Um, I'm the director of our LINCS programs. We have several programs um, that support um, opportunity youth and um, also low-income first-generation college students. And at PCC, we provide GED for thousands of students, a GED prep. My programs are specific for um, high school students who have dropped out, and we have contracts with school districts, Portland Public being our largest contract. Um, we have seven con uh, contracts in the Portland area. 
And um, as Carla said, um, the, the, the misalignment in the GED and the diploma and the focus on the diploma is actually a disincentive to school districts for contracting with us. We provide wraparound supports. We provide um, much more than just the GED prep, which is through our adult basic ed department in our college. We have staff that we call college success coaches that are working with students on many barriers to completion of a GED. And um, we recently changed our model. Our, our program's called Yes to College. Um, and the goal is a, uh, really a positive connection to post-secondary education and career and training. Um, GED is incidental to that, but we are supporting students along that path. Um, I'm grateful that you are um, addressing the issue of GED, um, and we're really working to destigmatize the GED. Um, I've been doing this for about 10 years, and um, it, it's gotten a little better, but there's still a, a huge stigma around the GED, and I really would like to see it be um, uh, just another way that there are multiple paths to get to post-secondary um, success and career and the GED is one of those uh, those opportunities um, and in the discussion of the costs I mean I think the costs are the, the tests also the instruction of prep and the wraparound supports um, just so you're aware there uh, students have to pay to even take practice tests under the Pearson maybe you're aware of that I just want to make sure and then also I really really resonate with the consolidation consolidated leadership across ODE and CCWD, these are systems that are not, um, although they should be maybe, um, they're not really communicating and aligned and having a point person that is doing that work across them um, would, is, is really necessary so that we can um, really work in a productive way. Okay. Thank you so much, we, are, um, we would of course invite you to submit your testimony as well. We're okay. looking for lots of help and support to uh, think, how, think through how we can um, be as effective as possible. So that actually concludes our time today. Madam Chair, just one, one question. Yes, yes. Uh, um, <laughs> we, we almost don't try and close this meeting. We had a timeline framework for the first part, <laughs> and and we weren't as persnickety um, for the second part. Great, so what what are we? What's our expectation? Yes. Just, Let's be let's be persnickety about the second part. What do you think, Peter? Since we so basically came to consensus on our recommendation, how would you like to do that? Turn it around. And would the intent be that you present it to the OEIG board? I'm, as a draft. As a draft, yeah. 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 I just, mean, have, just have to do it. You know, um, I, I sense the urgency and let's get done. I didn't. Um, I don't see it's sweeping a set of changes is going to push back. It's, it's editing. And so I, I feel good about it. Back to you by tomorrow. Okay. Tomorrow? Well, <laughs> right, right. Take that Friday. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> okay, great. And I'm happy to help and support one the way. Did you have another question or thought? Just, I, I guess, um, just reflecting on um, the last two presenters. What, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that I would hope that um, providing more support for students does not become the out for the K-12 system to just say, well, we're not going to provide for those students. We don't have to think of ways to connect uh, because there's this robust other service. So I, I think we need to continue to maintain. Provide Focus supports the over value, here, the true, yeah, the first and value. what mm -hmm. we need to do because it, I think in the ideal world, right, we wouldn't need to be doing mm -hmm. all of these because the other um, mm -hmm. students are getting disconnected for a variety of reasons because of issues mm -hmm. within the current system, and we're putting a lot of money into that system. So I just yep. want to keep the pressure on if we do a good job over here and provide supports. It's not as a we're not going to put pressure on the current system to improve. Right. I think, I think I mean, you have my full agreement. And also in an ideal world, we would not be talking about GED or the system in the equity committee either. I mean, this should be a conversation for the full OEIB. Um, but because of a whole host of challenges and inequalities, here we are today having this conversation on this committee. So I think we're, you know, we are, um, you know, Dr. Henry shared we have the second worst graduation rate. Um, that's what the article on was saying. Mm -hmm. Two articles last week. They're, they're a trustworthy news source. So. Well, <laughs> it, it just fits out the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we have this real rock and a hard place of, um, I mean, you're absolutely right. And with 
the number of young people we have out of school, we do need some positive options, and it can't be about building a second um, system so that it gives us an excuse to not do what we need to do with K through 12 and early learning, frankly. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, and this is totally unrelated to today, today's agenda, but um, there was a, it's, this is sort of just food for thought for um, the committee going forward. Um, there was an analysis done on um, instructional time in terms of um, substitute teachers um, in schools and um, how, I mean, it, I think it would be worth the committee looking at statewide what it looks like. So Portland apparently, in, I still need to like verify the data, but it's the fourth um, worst in the country in terms of teachers being out of classroom. And one of the things I hear a lot from parents is it's in actually the schools in which there's the highest need and some of the um, reasons for teachers being out of their classroom is the professional development requirements, which is super important. Um, but you think about the kids and the schools that need um, high quality instruction every day or the mm -hmm. most amount are the ones actually disproportionately um, receiving less because of, um, for good, in mm -hmm. good intentions, but it's having an unintended impact. And I think um, just given that the population that, that may be most impacted, so that's just, it's just a yep. theory um, that I have, so I'd want to look at the data, but it, I think it might be worth the committee looking at sort of how instructional time, um, or lack of it mm -hmm. is impacting students who were, you know, desperately trying to help close well, the right. well, achievement gap. Especially when we have one of the lowest number of school days. Yeah. I remember when my kids were in school a few years ago. My husband would go, "Do they ever go to school anymore?" And because, but then a lot of professional development days were non school days. But we already have a, such a short school calendar anyway. And then the teachers aren't in the classrooms. I agree with what you're saying. I just think that's a perfect example of the power of the equity lens questions to ask about unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. it's, it's also true by race, certain students are out of their learning to get tested more. Mm -hmm. So the good idea was test kids to make sure that where they're at to give them services, the unintended consequences. Same thing, the, the yeah. focus on priority schools, it's all great, but those teachers have more subs and so. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the professional development requirements, disproportionate discipline, short school year as it is and you know pretty soon the number of days the kids are in class and and then some of the other issues of why they're not in school um huge outcomes i think the oregonian um so the, the analysis they did on sort of the correlation between um lack of attendance and how it directly court seems to be a pretty direct correlation with um, high school graduation or getting a diploma it just it would be useful for us to look at that how these things all aggregate up and impact students and again in a dis in many ways a disproportionate way so just something for thought for future for yeah I think a, um, something around attendance and I think we have not yet been able to give the attention we've wanted to about disproportionality or attendance or any of those things and I think we do have some some more work but I think if you can hold on to those items as we yep. think through kind of our, our, our ongoing work plan once we make it through some of our intending tasks, that would be great. So I do want to note that Serena Stoudemire is in the audience, uh, is actually currently working on analyses of attendance mm -hmm. and, what's, and, and how do we identify districts that are doing a really good job and lessons learned about that. So that will be something coming out of OEIB in the in the future months. Yeah, because you have, if you take the combined, the student's not in the classroom, right. or the teacher's not in the classroom, right. or there's actually no school, no school. Um, because of shortened school year, um, I mean, that all ends, results in less instruction. Not to mention only half of the 12th grade. I mean, there's so many places where there is no, there's a half a day program for, for the 12th grade. Uh, anyhow, okay. we all have our. <laughs> Okay. Well, in the spirit of ending early, I'm <laughs> by two minutes. Okay.